Aloha. <clears throat> Welcome to the second half of lecture nine. I'm going to call this my soapbox lecture. You'll see why in a few minutes. Um, last time we talked about the highlights of the fetal period from nine weeks up to about 29 weeks and kind of all the stuff that's going on during that period. Mostly just the fetus getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the organ system is becoming more and more advanced. Um, <clears throat> we talked about viability and survivability and some other stuff like that. Uh, so we're going to pick it up at about 30 weeks to birth. Okay. We're going to talk about the last few weeks of the fetal period. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the neonatal period, uh, some insights about birth and stuff like that. So what you are looking at right here, here's a picture of my beautiful, sweet, wonderful wife at about 30 weeks gestation with this little guy right here. His name is Lehi. I'm sorry, Lehi is my current youngest. This is Tiankum. <laughs> uh, trust me, when you've got seven, you mix up the names a lot. Uh, yeah, so anyway, she's about 30 weeks pregnant, I believe with Tiankum. <laughs> or I might have the wrong pictures. You know, those babies, they kind of all look the same. So, uh, from about 30 weeks, between 30 weeks to birth, uh, the fetus is going to become spontaneously responsive to light. The pupillary reflex is going to be visible. You know, if you um, <clears throat> are looking up in there with a camera and you shine a light on the belly, you'll see that little pupil constrict as it grows, as, as the light grows in the, in the womb, which is really a pretty cool thing. Um, they're very aware of light outside. If it's bright outside, they can see that. If it's dark outside, they can see that too. Uh, so growth slows down during this period. Uh, baby continues to put on fat though. Uh, by birth, most babies have a pretty chubby appearance. Delivery is expected about 40 weeks gestation. Now the book says 38 weeks from conception, but I've had seven kids and I've treated hundreds of mothers through their pregnancies. So I'm going to respectfully disagree with them and say that most babies are born at around 40 weeks after conception, some later. Um, so which brings us into, it's a great segue into a discussion about uh, due dates, expected due dates. So we've got some interesting ways of doing things in the United States. Uh, I've noticed over the years that there's a really big push, particularly in the United States that man, you get past that due date and they always want to induce you. You get a few days past the due date, they're already talking about induction. And when you get a week past your due date, they're, the OB is usually, now granted, this is a generality. I know there are exceptions to this, but in general, uh, obstetricians are like, man, you're a week past your due date. We got to get that baby induced. We got to get that baby out of you or X, Y, Z is going to happen. This is a load of baloney. Okay. Um, let me explain what a due date is. <clears throat> a due date is a guess. They don't know exactly when you conceived. They just take their best guess based on when your last menstrual cycle was. So that estimate is only accurate within a two week period. So when, let's say your due date is February 14th. What that means is that that baby's likely to be born sometime between February 1st and February 28th. It is an estimate that is accurate, you know, February 14th, give or take two weeks either way. So really, instead of a due date, they ought to call it a guest date. Um, I know around here at about a week after your due date, they're really pushing hard for people to induce. But the fact is, your baby isn't even late until you're two weeks past your due date. Once you get two weeks past your due date, now you can legitimately say, okay, that baby's late. And then is a good time to start thinking about induction. Um, now, my wife, two of our children were born four weeks past the due date. Four weeks. Yes, you heard me right. And they were both completely fine. Now, they had lost their vernix caseosa, right? And so they had quite a bit of exposure to the amniotic fluid. So when they came out, their skin was a little bit rashed up. Other than that, they were completely fine. Mom was completely fine. And this is four weeks past the due date. So this whole business of, oh my gosh, it's going to be so dangerous. It's not dangerous. You're not even late until you're two weeks past your due date. Now, I'm going to get off that soapbox and uh, <clears throat> we're going to get onto another soapbox a little bit later on. But uh, yes, babies are expected to be delivered right around 40 weeks, give or take two weeks. 
Uh, and the average newborn baby weighs somewhere between six to eight pounds, okay? Now, the primary fuel for fetal development and for fetal energy is glucose. That is mostly what babies live off of. Adults, we live mostly off of fat. We burn fat for energy. We burn glucose for energy only when we have to. Our brains live primarily off, primarily off of glucose, but the rest of our body lives primarily off of fat for energy. Um, but fetal energy is almost exclusively from burning glucose. Um, the fetus also needs amino acids, um, which are building blocks. It needs insulin to metabolize the glucose. And there are some other hormones and polypeptides, mostly enzymes and stuff like that, uh, that are also required. Now, the insulin is produced by the fetus. He makes that or he or she makes that themselves. And, uh, but virtually every other supply that that baby needs for growth are all provided by mom through the placenta. <clears throat> so one of the primary substrates uh, for fetal metabolism is oxygen. Of course, you need oxygen to burn glucose to run this whole process of building a baby. So one of the factors that has a big effect on fetal oxygen is carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. So Basically, the more carbon dioxide that is in mom's blood, the less oxygen there is in mom's blood. And the less oxygen that is in mom's blood, the less, the, the less there is available for the baby, okay? So this is a big deal when you talk about smoking during pregnancy, okay? Smoking fills the body with carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Uh, carbon monoxide is directly harmful for, to the fetus anyway, but the more CO2 and CO that are in mom's blood, the less oxygen there is available for baby to use for development. Now, this also leads me into a discussion about vaping because a lot of people say, oh, well, I'm not gonna smoke, but I can go ahead and vape during my pregnancy because that's much safer. That is the biggest load of horse manure that could possibly be imagined. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. Uh, vaping isn't gonna produce as much in the way of CO2 and CO. But uh, vaping, basically, you're vaporizing oil at a high, high, high temperature to vaporize that oil. And this creates a whole bunch of other chemicals that are very toxic to the fetus. And all of this, all of the, uh, like all of the harmful chemicals in cigarette smoke and all of the harmful chemicals that are produced by vaping, all of that crosses the placenta, every bit of it. And that gets into the baby. So you're putting everything that you put into your lungs, you're putting into that baby's body. Um, now, vaping, um, in addition to the other horrible toxic chemicals that it creates, it is a much, much, much higher dose, generally speaking, than, of nicotine than smoking is. So most of you are probably familiar with what a joule is, right? Joules, uh, every, every joule, every puff, okay, every inhalation on a joule has more nicotine than an entire cigarette. So by the time you've done three or four puffs on your Juul, you've smoked a half a pack of cigarettes. And there's a lot of other mods out there where you can you know, modulate the amount of nicotine. Some of these things crank up to levels where you can smoke and you can, you can get an entire pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine in a single puff. So you're dosing that baby then with an entire pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine every time you suck on that vaping mod. And, and it, <laughs> It's terrible. Now I know that none of you, hopefully, none of you vape and none of you smoke, and that's great. But this is good information for you to have for friends, and it's great information for you to have in the future when you go into healthcare fields. Okay. In addition to nicotine, there's all these other ter terrible chemicals that vaping creates. And if you don't believe me, let me tell you a story. My younger brother who's currently 40, he's about to turn 41, but when he was about 39 years old, so he used to smoke when he was younger. He smoked for several years and then he quit smoking for about six years. And we were all like, yes, he finally quit smoking. This is great. He's on the right track. And then about six years after he quit smoking, he started vaping. Why? Because he's like, oh, this is great. I can feed this habit that I have. I can feed this addiction that I have. And it's not as dangerous as smoking because that's what the vaping companies were advertising. Well, turns out 
So when he was 39, he got a hold of a bad cartridge and he contracted a condition called e volley And I don't know if most of you have heard of this, but e volley is basically a chemical burn on the inside of your lungs that creates holes in your lungs and causes your lungs to collapse. So my little brother, both of his lungs collapsed. His right lung collapsed twice actually. And he was in the hospital for about six weeks. And at the age of 39, ruined his lungs for the rest of his life. He will be on oxygen until he dies at the age of 49, okay? Or 39 rather. Uh, and now he's 40 years old and at the age of 40, he cannot walk up a flight of seven stairs, which is his front porch. He cannot walk up a flight of seven stairs without stopping and taking a rest halfway. And this is from vaping. And in addition to that, They've done studies now looking at the lungs of people who vape versus people that smoke. And what they're finding is that after about 15 years of vaping, the lungs have the same amount of damage as people who smoked for 25 to 30 years. So vaping is damaging the lungs much faster than smoking damaged the lungs. It's a much higher dose of nicotine than smoking. So please, 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 please don't believe and don't ever let anybody else you know believe that vaping is any safer than smoking because the fact is it's even more dangerous than smoking for both the mom and for the fetus. Um, anyway, let me get off of that soapbox <laughs> and we can get on to the next one in a minute, <laughs> which is alcohol. I guess we'll get onto that one right now. So alcohol when you're pregnant, the effect of alcohol on a, uh, on a baby depends on the stage at which you start drinking the alcohol. If you're early in the embryological stage, then you're going to have what's called fetal alcohol syndrome, which is brain damage and uh, abnormalities in the other organs and a very low birth weight. <clears throat> this is fetal alcohol syndrome. If you start drinking alcohol later on in pregnancy during the fetal uh, stage, especially later in the fetal stage, then what you're going to have is a low birth weight not so much of the fetal alcohol syndrome and the organ and brain damage uh, because by then baby is producing um, the enzymes that you need to process the alcohol. Um, but you're going to have a very low birth weight. It very much interferes with the nutrition of the fetus. So, and let's talk about that versus, and you can see on this chart, right? Um, we've got, you know, twins, um, poor maternal nutrition, uh, smokers, um, and then we've got normal birth weight. So what tends to happen with smokers and with alcohol, smoking and alcohol, is you tend to have smaller babies, right? Now we've got with poor, so let me, let me discuss poor maternal nutrition, okay? Because uh, this warrants a little bit of discussion too. Babies are amazing. The human body is incredible. And if mom is starving to death, that baby will still take what it needs if it is there. So if mom's hungry, baby's gonna develop normally, right? So you women that are sick and can't eat a darn thing and get no nutrition at all for the first, you know, eight to 12 weeks or however long it takes, you're so sick, you're just vomiting all the time and you lose all that weight, don't worry. Baby's just stealing what your body already has and that baby's gonna develop perfectly normally. In order for maternal malnutrition to cause a low birth weight, that mother has to be starving to death. That mother has to literally be dying of starvation before it's ever gonna affect that baby's birth weight. Now, in a case of extreme maternal uh, malnutrition, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a baby that has normal body proportions. The limbs are gonna be the right length, the body's gonna be the right length, the head's gonna be the right size. That baby's just gonna be skinny. So it's gonna have a low birth weight because of a lack of subcutaneous fat and maybe a lack of muscle mass, right? It's gonna have a low birth weight because it's skinny, but it's otherwise normally proportioned. Smoking and alcohol is gonna actually cause your baby to be a smaller baby. Its proportions are gonna be smaller. Its limbs are gonna be shorter. Its head is gonna be smaller. Its torso is gonna be shorter, right? So you're gonna have um, smaller, a smaller sized baby versus a skinny baby with normal body proportions. Uh, I hope I explained that well enough that it makes sense. Um, but that's kind of the difference between if mom's starving to death, that's one thing. <laughs> if uh, the same thing happens with twins, right? The twins are splitting the nutrition. 
you got two babies in there. Yes, they're both going to be smaller than normal babies. They're going to be more or less normally proportioned. They're just going to be small. Um, at any rate, uh, I think we kind of beat that dead horse into the ground. Don't smoke. Don't vape. Don't drink alcohol. Oh, you know what, though? Uh, something else that's worth mentioning is soda. Most people don't think about that. Oh, soda's not bad. Well, then soda, what makes soda fizzy is carbon dioxide. So if you're drinking a ton of soda when you're pregnant, you are flooding your blood with carbon dioxide, which yes, robs your baby of oxygen. Now, it's not as big of a deal because you can drink a can of soda and within a matter of you know probably several minutes, you're gonna breathe all that carbon dioxide that you just absorbed right back out and everything's gonna come back to normal. But it's worth considering that every time you drink a can of soda, that baby's going without a certain percentage of oxygen that it would have had. So I always recommend to new moms, please don't drink, uh, don't drink carbonated things and especially not caffeinated carbonated things. Caffeine is a drug it's, and it crosses the placenta. So every time you drink caffeine, your baby's drinking caffeine. And I'm telling you, caffeine is not good for a developing brain. Caffeine affects the brain very directly. And there are receptors in the brain for those types of chemicals. And anytime that you flood the brain with chemicals that it wouldn't normally be there, it's gonna alter how that brain develops. So stay away from the caffeine, stay away from the carbonation. Yeah, it's not as bad as smoking and alcohol and things like that, but it's also not good. Even if it is for a few minutes myself, I would want my baby to be able to get all of the oxygen and all of the nourishment that it can. Uh, for that little brain to develop. And it's developing really, really quickly all through this whole period. Right, so I think that's just about it for the soapbox portion of this. <laughs> um, we can go ahead and move on now. So um, we're gonna talk about some methods of uh, fetal assessment, right? So this is an ultrasound, right? I think this picture is in the book. Um, ultrasound by far, is yeah, this is in the book on page 69. Ultrasound is by far the most common method of fetal assessment. And the reason for that is because it's pretty inexpensive and there's also no known side effects. It's very, very safe for the baby. Uh, so ultrasound is very commonly used, by far the most common method of assessing the fetus. And sometimes, sometimes it's not entirely, entirely accurate. You can't get a real clear picture with ultrasound. You can get, you know, measures, um, you can get size measurements and length measurements and all that kind of stuff. You can get circumference and diameter. There's a lot you can do with ultrasound, but it's not a super clear picture. I know lots of people, even still today. Uh, in fact, I had a patient just recently that had a baby a couple of weeks ago. All through the pregnancy was told it's a boy, it's a boy, it's a boy, it's a boy. Every time they did an ultrasound, there was that little male junk in between the legs. And when the baby was born, guess what? It was a girl. So you don't get a very clear picture of ultrasound. Usually you can see most things that you need to see at any rate. Um, some other methods include um, amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. Um, so amniocentesis is pretty simple. You take a big long needle, you stab it through the belly and you take a sample of the amniotic fluid. And what you're looking for is fetal cells. You're using those fetal cells primarily for DNA analysis. You're gonna run a DNA analysis, all kinds of labs. Now, um, another one is chorionic villus sampling. You can take a catheter and feed it through the vagina and um, run it along the membranes into the placenta and take fetal cell samples that way. Or you can come straight through the belly and chorionic villus samples uh, um, placental cells is basically what you're getting um, straight through the belly. Now, all of these carry with it some risk. Um, in the case of amniocentesis, you are piercing the amniotic membrane. <laughs> that carries with it some risk. You might uh, cause a leak. You might, and yes, that does happen. <laughs> uh, you might cause a leak that doesn't seal up. You also might um, create an infection inside the womb. Uh, you know, there's a certain amount of risk associated with these procedures. Uh, much more so than ultrasound and other less invasive procedures. Same thing here. You are piercing the placenta in both of these cases. This one, you're stripping along the membranes and piercing the placenta uh, with this catheter, with this villus catheter. Um, so they're a little more risky than some of the other procedures. And, and again, they're mostly used for DNA analysis to check for things like... Um, 
Down syndrome and cystic fibrosis and genetic conditions like that. Um, there are other methods now that are a lot safer. For example, they can take a sample of mom's blood. And in maternal blood, there is a very small amount, but a certain number of fetal cells that actually get through the placenta that are floating around in mom. And they can isolate those fetal cells and, analy and analyze the DNA in those. Much, much safer, much less invasive, a lot safer for the baby. Um, and so what are like when we first started having kids, this was kind of how they did DNA analysis. This was all there was um, by, I forget what it was, our fourth or fifth kid. They primarily don't do that anymore. Now they use maternal blood samples to isolate fetal cells, which is a lot safer for mom. Now, some people still do this and there's times when it's appropriate. There's times when this is called for, but most of the time, if they want to run DNA analysis on the baby, they take a sample of mother's blood nowadays. Uh, let's see. Let me look at my notes and make sure I didn't miss anything. I think we're good. So uh, some other forms of <clears throat> fetal analysis are uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and CT. Um, now with CT, you can see a lot more. You can see an awful lot more. You get a much more clear, high resolution picture. The problem is that it exposes that developing baby, that developing brain, all those developing organs to a huge amount of radiation. CT scans have a lot of radiation. So they generally won't do a CT scan unless they really, really, really need to. Now MRI is much safer than CT, but it's very, very expensive. And the trouble with doing MRI on babies, on fetuses, is they're moving. How do you make a fetus sit still for 20 minutes to have an MRI done? And so the images tend to come out really, really blurry. This uh, slide that you're looking at, this is a, an MRI of a fetus. Um, so it becomes problematic just because the baby moves a lot and it's also very expensive. Now, there are things that you can see on this in terms of soft tissue and things like that that you can't see in other ways. Um, but, you know, it's problematic. So eventually, after all is said and done, you're going to end up with one of these. Okay. And this is what it's all about ending up with a baby. Hooray. So this is my oldest son. This is Moroni. Um, he was born uh, right at nine pounds. He was a pretty big boy. Um, but anyway, after baby is born, now we enter what is called the neonatal period. Uh, the neonatal, neonatal period is considered the first 28 days after birth. Now, uh, a neonate loses about 10% of its body weight during the first few days, a uh, few to several days. And this is because mom's milk hasn't come in and also because they lose meconium. So meconium, for those who don't know, is the first poop, right? The baby's been building up poop in its colon all through birth and it hasn't let it. It's not very much because again, um, mom's eliminating most of the weight for a baby. So what it is, is it's just amniotic fluid and, and things like that, they get into the colon and get processed and they reabsorb all the fluids out of it. And you end up with this black tarry kind of stool called meconium. So baby loses meconium, has its first poop and, and there isn't really any milk at first. Mom is producing this stuff called colostrum and colostrum is really great stuff. You wanna have colostrum because colostrum is basically antibodies. It is immune stuff. Um, coming out of the breast for a baby to eat, which is very, very protective of the baby for those first few days of life when it's very susceptible to, you know, viruses and bacteria and stuff like that. This is a really good thing to have. So moms or future moms, if it's at all possible, try to nurse your baby, at least for those first few days, get that colostrum in there. It is so protective of the baby. Uh, at any rate, after a few to several days, mom's milk comes in. And once the milk comes in, uh, all kinds of terrible stuff happens to mom called engorgement. And it's really sore and there's a lot of breast tenderness and you increase like two or three cup sizes. And it's not too much fun for mom, but all of a sudden baby has lots and lots of food and starts to gain lots and lots of weight. Uh, but prior to that time, baby can lose about 10% of the body weight. Uh, and that's perfectly normal. It's okay for that to happen. Uh, now, at birth, a baby can see just fine. It's just that babies are very nearsighted. So for about a foot, they can see very clearly, but any farther away than that, it starts to get really blurry for them. So when you're right in the face, oogling over the baby, baby can see your face very clearly. When he's holding your hand, he can see your hand very clearly. He can see the breast very clearly when he's breastfeeding. Um, but as things get farther away than about 12 inches, it gets very, very blurry for him. 
Um, it's also important to remember uh, a newborn baby is not just a miniature adult, right? A, their body proportions are very different and their body systems are not fully, uh, fully developed or fully functional yet. Now, similarly, a premature baby is very, very different from a full-term baby. They're not the same. Um, their lungs are less developed, their kidneys are, and you consider how fast development is happening during that whole gestational period. A week, two weeks is a really, really big difference in the development of that baby. Um, so that's, you know, a week or two is a really long time develop, developmentally for a neonate. This is why they try so hard to get you to get close to the due date. If a baby's coming a month early, they'll put you on, if, if you start trying to go into labor, they'll put you on bed rest. They'll uh, give you drugs to try to stall the labor. They'll do everything they can to keep that baby in, even if it's just for a few more days. Because if they can keep that baby in for just a few more days, it could be the difference between that baby needing an incubator or not, or that baby needing to be on oxygen or not. Or in some cases, it can be the difference between that baby having surfactant and not having surfactant, and therefore surviving or dying. Right, so when we're talking about premature babies, like developmentally, a week is a long time, even a few days is a long time. So that's something really worth um, remembering as you go through this process. It's also one of the reasons that I'm so big on wait until you're two weeks past your due date to get induced, uh, because two weeks developmentally is a really long time. Uh, so anyway, that's gonna do it for lecture nine. That is the end of the fetal period, the end of the neonatal period. Congratulations, we've had a baby. It's beautiful, look at that guy, isn't he cute? You know what, he's not so cute anymore. He's 13 years old right now, and there isn't much cute about him now. He's an awesome kid, don't get me wrong, and I love that boy, and he makes me proud every single day, but I'm telling you, he's just not cute like he used to be. <laughs> he's like a little big smelly man child now. <laughs> But um, yeah, they all start out so adorable. Um, yeah, so that's it for lecture nine. Um, there's not going to be uh, a quiz on that chapter, but we are going to have some of that material on the midterm. So on Thursday during the Zoom meeting, we're going to do the midterm review. Uh, Again, really worth your while to come to that review. It's gonna be a very good review. It's gonna make the midterm much, much easier for you. It's gonna cover everything that we've covered so far this semester, all the way from, um, gosh, even preconception through uh, uh, reproductive anatomy, all the way through uh, you know, birth and the neonatal period. Uh, so make sure if you can, that you come to that Zoom meeting, bring any question that you have, ask uh, anything that you need clarification of, uh, for me, that's really the best part, the interaction directly with you guys, even if it is through a computer, through a cons computer screen. It's very stimulating to me to be asked questions and you guys make me think and you keep me on my toes. And, and that's where I feel like the most actual teaching happens is when you ask me questions and I clarify stuff, or you ask me questions that I know the answer to. Those are my favorite questions, the ones I don't know the answer to, because then I learn something, which is really cool for me. Uh, but yeah, that'll be it for lecture nine. We will see you guys hopefully at the Zoom meeting. And I wish you all the best of luck on the midterm. Uh, I'm sure you guys will absolutely crush it. Uh, in the meantime, have a good week. Aloha.